experience, but but there were, you know, with all the great thinkers at MIT, looking at, uh, in fact, there's a, right in the, my office down here, I've got a report, MIT uh, potential for uh, geothermal. And um, this has already been demonstrated for a campus as complex as our campuses are, as uh, providing um, sufficient energy not only for the entire campus with intensive laboratory demands, but, and this is totally carbon free. It's geothermal, and so and this is over at the ETH in Missouri, their new campus up on there. Gee, here's, here's, a, here's a chance to really innovate and demonstrate in a very large complex um, the aspirations of having zero energy impacts or very reduced uh, impacts as Novartis campus in Basel has been demonstrating it can be done as ETH in Zurich has demonstrated it can be done and it's actually built off the theory that comes out of MIT that's that's the issue and you have all the innovation in the world in the media lab of alternative transportation systems uh, that they've been developing you have the um, you know, the future energy concepts uh, elsewhere at MIT. And here you have MIT highly invested in new property and you're just going to give run-of-the-mill, ho-hum, commercial spin on this. It's just, that's the opportunity that's lost. Because uh, if you don't have our own institutions demonstrating the possibilities, uh, then who's left to do it? Who's going to do it? If you have the aspirations of the city of Cambridge, as I pointed out in that memo, memorandum of understanding, which I have not seen the details of, but it's a it's it's an agreement between MIT, Harvard, and Cambridge to participate in in making uh, the city of Cambridge a shining example of a sustainable uh, city of the future. And you let an opportunity like this go by. That's that that's what I thought would be unfortunate. You can certainly have a footprint and say, no, what are you going to put on that footprint? Uh, are you going to do deep well geothermal? Are you going to, you going to do rainwater scavenging? You're going to do, what are you going to do with this boat? So uh, there's a lot of details that could be, that, that really could, uh, you know, be part of uh, something well beyond the, you know, lead criteria, which are prescriptive, check the boxes, you know, put up bike racks and you get that credit and you're right next to transportation. In fact, these buildings, if they can't get gold, they, they shouldn't even be considered. I mean, you have so many uh, credits that you can get just by given location and how these So, um, and, you know, Basel has, has uh, they, across their campus, they have invested in these you know, just as they built the campus in the first place, they, you know, they they said, "All right, we're going to really think this thing through and build a deep well uh, energy sources or sinks in some cases, because you're dumping hot hot air or hot temperatures down in, so you've got the expanded cooling." Is there any legal or other reason why this actually cannot be done in well, the United you, States? Uh, no. There's no but now the, the different geological strata. Now this could you know one has to think hard whether this particular um, location is suitable for it. But I'll tell you, just up the road, Harvard Blackstone Building has two wells a thousand two a thousand feet deep, and running that building on geothermal. There were two buildings that were totally renovated. They're double platinum and by the rating systems. And that was one of our first, that was our first geothermal system. So now it's being done all across the campus. And those Harvard buildings? That's Harvard buildings. So Harvard is doing this and MIT is not. Well, I don't know. So, well, here's, here's the MIT I, sustainability checkoff. It's lead gold. You know, you're talking yeah, double platinum. Yeah, it's easy to get gold. And, and then stay, intent, feasibility of District Steam. District Steam, I mean, like, isn't. Isn't that like old stuff, or is it like I, 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 just, 
it, it, you do get more efficiencies, I think, in some districts green. But I'll tell you, um, this is the big battle going on in Cambridge on the uh, Science One building uh, at Harvard, uh, which is across the river. Do we connect that, uh, you know, the Benesch group, the German design group, were all for distributive systems, co-generation, much more efficient systems, but we were already invested in, you know, the steam plant, right? And you have the tunnels. So do you do something that jumps technology and puts it in the future, or do you just keep the network going because you've got the, you've got the distributive heat steam system now? So, you know, the, the, but I would say, all right, all these things are good, but what are the alternatives to these? And does this really demonstrate the most advanced technology that, that's available? And I bet you you could go to MIT engineers and ask them, you know, is it feasible to build something better than this now in this area? But, um, but why wouldn't we be thinking about having really demonstrating this? Thing? These, all these guys are infatuated with working with Mazdar. You know, out in the middle of the desert and in, uh, in the uh, Middle East, this advanced techno city with zero carbon to play with all this technology, and and you have an opportunity here with the investment of the university that will make a lot of money off this commercial property. Why aren't they doing it here? So, so I I think there are there are I think questions that should be asked, and I think the city should be asking. Uh, you know, asking the questions too. I'm, I'm saying if, if we just, if we went and built in this decade as much as we built in the previous 50 years, and That's we didn't projection. do it, and we didn't do it in this aggressive, sustainable fashion that, that, you, that you suggest, you think that Cambridge will just fall apart? We will have brownouts, no, we think, want this, no, we want that. There's more profound implications across the world, but uh, in terms of in terms of resource limitations. So, but, I mean, if this if this were, you know, Simmons, you could say, well, you know, do they have the capacity to really engage in that kind of thing? Not done economically, but you know, the, but the fact that it is MIT, and the knowledge and technologies are coming out of this their institution. I mean that there the ideas are changing the world. And why don't why aren't they being demonstrated? Oh, okay. What I'm on now is this uh, Cambridge uh, Adaptation Task Force. Okay. So I mean, but that task force should be called upon to even you know weigh in on something like this. Um, you know because hopefully then they've hired a set of consultants that are looking at. How would you now go out and either retrofit your existing buildings, or when you're considering new ones, how do you do this in light of intense precipitation events, increased uh, temperature extremes? What would you do? And you, you put up these buildings that are all going to require air conditioning, that if you don't think this through, it's just going to dump more heat back into the city streets. So if you want to keep pushing temperature stress of urban densities, you know, build conventionally and you'll guarantee that that's what you'll get. Uh, and uh, so there, um, and, and maybe, maybe the thing is to, uh, you know, raise a lot of these issues that are, that are visioning issues that, that for which most likely they haven't thought through what the implications are uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, heat island effects, uh, uh, temperature stress effects in these communities, or at street levels, and there's some. And again, coming out of the group at, uh, in the architectural engineering department, because I know the faculty there, they're coming up with the models that examine the walkability of cities, that examine the heat stress in urban areas when you put a lot of high glazed buildings that that throw keep the heat out of the interior, but throw it back into the street. That's, that's in effect, that's what they're doing. So now, now it's, you're not even, even though you, you think you're on the shade side, you're being, uh, you're getting a lot of 
visible and infrared thrown back at you by these highly reflective uh, low E windows. So you know there are there are some um, you know more. Let me just say there's some more holistic thinking that's going on. Uh, another thing I saw in Zurich. Actually, this is the thing. So MIT is part of this. Uh, ETH Zurich, Singapore National University. There's like a fifty million dollar project looking at cities of the future. And, and faculty and grad students are engaged in looking at all aspects of cities of the future. This tremendous knowledge base, and why aren't they being called upon to, to weigh in on these issues? I mean, if this isn't the living laboratory, what is? Mm. So, you know, I, I, but yet they'll go off to Singapore and... Uh, so MIT is at Zurich in, in Singapore? They're all connected electronically. They have staff that's over there. Faculty go over there and spend a, a, a lot of time. And this is money that was lured, uh, money out of Singapore to lure the, the most advanced thinking on, on designing mm -hmm. cities of the future. Who, who are some of the engineers and architects involved, you know? Uh, Les Norbrook goes over there. How do you spell his name? Uh, he's up in uh, architectural engineering. Bless Norfolk. Oh, Norfolk. Yeah. Let me go get this other document down here. Uh, Christoph Reinhardt. He's, he's got this great group of people who are looking at these issues of livability in cities, walkability, mm -hmm. heat stress, comfort models. Well, Future uh, geothermal energy, MIT document for the U.S. Doing this stuff for the DOE. Hmm. Uh, you can pick names out of this, but so impact of enhanced geothermal systems in the United States in the 21st century. I take a picture. I bet you they would love to have. Uh, around test facilities built right on campus. And this is kind of a. If Susan Rasmussen asked your advice before on Alewife, um, I guess we could try to get one of the counselors to ask the question about why, why isn't the city availing themselves of this advisory committee they've already set up to take a, a second look at this stuff. Nika or even the mayor herself are the most uh, outspoken on environmental issues. Yeah. The mayor. Uh, yeah. Nika and mayor. Uh, Nika and the mayor, yeah. David, uh, Henrietta Davis mm -hmm. has yeah. been the environmental candidate all the time. Minka is the new one. Um, but the... Uh, I mean, you're suggesting that one of the two uh, issue an invitation uh, and say, Dr. Spangler, will you come and give us your point of view on this project? Is that the, is that the idea? No, I, I would, you know, they certainly could ask that. I know Henrietta well enough that if she asked me, I probably would. But uh, I think through, um, I, I think... It, you know, the city goes ahead and establishes a directionality of saying, well, we're going to look at our whole infrastructure in terms of climate change. And to do that in a static request and not look at it in, in it for, you know, future development, it would be short-sighted, right? So, I mean, so you think the committee uh, and its uh, and its consultants should have been asked to address what what isn't you know what isn't two decades away because who knows but what is you know some of the most immediate uh, you know, plans for future development in different parts of the city and what might be the impact or what additional criteria would you want to place on those developments? And what's the proper name of the committee? Uh, it, it, I, you know, John Balzac asked me to be on this, and I have to go back and dig up my emails. It's 
It's some, it has to do with uh, adaptation. You, you called it the Cambridge Adaptation Task Force? Something like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But, that but it's, it's run by the city? It's, it's run by the city. Okay. And, yeah. and, and you're, you're a part of that? Yeah. I couldn't go to the first meeting, uh, so I sent one of my associates to uh, cover for that. Um, I don't know. The issue of opportunity to demonstrate the technology that we'll need to, to get through this century, and here's a chance. And if we keep building conventional stuff, we'll never get there. Uh, and uh, and the fact that you have the brain power of, uh, of uh, MIT and you would fail to do it or ask them to do it. I think that's the lost opportunity. You know, what I, the other thing I learned in Zurich that in, that when I was there is that they passed a referendum. What they told me, 76% voted in favor of changing the constitution of the city of Zurich to put them on a planning path that is in their constitution. To, so to undo it is very difficult. That would be what's called the 2,000 Watt Society. And the 2,000, right now they're at, on an average per person, you know, is like 5,000 watts to get through a day. Then you multiply this over. So they kept the concept simple. And, and it has set every department, every person in, that's in working for city administration on this quest to figure out how to do it. Hmm. Uh, and it's it's challenging. Yeah, and, here, yeah. and, they're, and they're further along on the integration of transportation and a lot of hydro in the country. Yeah. And, and yet it's going to be hard for them to do it. But they, they said, this is, we have to be an example to the world. We have to solve this in a developed country with resources. And you know, until someone steps up and uh, with that kind of image, uh, in, in, and why not? I mean, this is why it's perfect. It, in Cambridge would be an ideal city to do this in, given the institutions that anchor both ends of that city. So one of the things we were able to do at Harvard to push the sustainability agenda is actually change the financial structure of how we calculate rate of return. And, and you know, the argument is we've been around, why, why do we need a three-year rate of return? Why do we need it? So why do we make these decisions? So we're pushing out our buildings up to 20 years. Will something, will a capital investment in some feature that goes into a building pay back in 20 years with a certain discount rate that, you know, we get? So, you know, you start changing, and if this is all run off commercial, off a commercial enterprise, you know they're not using those numbers. They're probably using the conventional three years. You know, it's funny. I had a meeting this morning with the with the planners at Harvard because we've gotten a good receptivity uh, from Harvard planners uh, over the remodeling of the houses. So the river houses are going to be remodeled, and we're looking at advanced lighting systems that tie to circadian rhythm that improve the quality of sleep. We're looking at ventilation issues. We're looking at acoustics because of, uh, of disruption of uh, and cognitive function. We're saying, listen, you, you know, we have an opportunity, and they were receptive to this opportunity to to take knowledge generated on campus. This is an NSF project I have. Use our buildings and our students as part of our knowledge base. And, and and then learn from that to do to put it into uh, the next generation of improvements in buildings. I mean, it's a it's a and we didn't come to this e easily. I mean, this came out of and Fred Abernathy knows this as well as anyone because he he actually studied campus systems uh, more than any other person you know around, and so it got got this concept of the campus having all the building prototypes. That we have any, el, anywhere in the world, except maybe you're in the U.S. anyway, except prisons. Maybe we don't. We have dining services, and we have health care, and we have daycare, and we have housing, and we have office buildings. We have, we have all the types of buildings there are, 
and to make studies out of our own buildings, we learn a lot. And uh, and that this isn't so the divide between the to the academic side and the and the administrative side um, was always um, such a divide that you that the university I thought had difficulties of using the knowledge that was being generated out of the research by their own faculty, using it in a, in a proactive way. And I think we've got a couple of demonstrations at Harvard where that is happening, that we're doing that now. The one I just gave you and then there are a couple of others. To be clear, I'm not against development, I'm not against no. growth, I'm not against densification, but I, I am for reducing the footprint, the energy, the water footprint, the impact, and all the externalities that come with this, because there are implications to how comfortable is the streetscape? You know, where are the amenities of parks? You know, that we're, you know, we shouldn't be giving these things up, because another part of our research is working with the uh, U.S. National Park Service and looking at the health benefits of being immersed in nature. And, uh, no, so I, I didn't get a... So I just want to make sure... I, I didn't get an anti-development message at all. Um, what, I, what I heard and what I perked up at was when you were talking about here's a chance to really innovate because we have, we have homegrown knowledge that's being applied, applied uh, overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, Novartis campus in ba Basel and the ETH in uh, Zurich. Zurich. Yeah. And MIT researchers are involved in cities of the future in Singapore. Singapore, right, right. also that. Oh, um, who's the one in the desert? Oh, that's Mastar in the desert. That's the... What's uh, it called? City of the future. Mass? Mastar. Ma yeah, Mastar. And uh, it's, a, it's a carbonless, uh, zero carbon uh, city to demonstrate all these new technologies. It's actually built in park. Some MIT production.